Hello, I'm Kamal Santa Maria. This is Counting the Cost on Al Jazeera, your weekly look at the world of business and economics. This week, safety in the air. 2018 was the deadliest year for the aviation industry for years. So as the big players gather in France for the Paris Air Show, we'll be asking what went wrong for the world's safest form of transport. Also this week, Italy's populist coalition is considering a new domestic currency. Is that a move that could lead to its exit from the euro? And if you're worried about your kids having too much screen time or being too exposed to the latest tech, then we will show you this audio gadget, which speaks, doesn't listen. So who would be in the airline business these days? What well, with trade tensions and disputes over aircraft subsidies and loans and the slowing global economy. But you know, there's a far more troubling trend to deal with, uh, which the industry could well do without. 2018 was the deadliest year the aviation industry has experienced for some time. Yes, there were 37.8 million flights last year, which averages out to around 103,000 flights a day. So that volume is important to remember when we consider these numbers. But there were 523 deaths last year, the highest number in four years, and up from just 59 in 2017. And this year is already looking bad, 232 deaths from the accidents involving Ethiopian Airlines and Russia's Aeroflot. That is well above the five-year average of 189 fatalities a year, according to the Aviation Safety Network. And front and centre in all this is Boeing, a manufacturer once praised by pilots for its perceived safety. There was that phrase, if it ain't Boeing, I ain't going. And yet, two of its brand new 737 MAX jets have crashed Indonesia's Lion Air in October and Ethiopian Airlines in March, killing 346 people. Boeing expects the cost of grounding what is its fastest selling jet will be more than a billion dollars, and the airlines themselves expect losses of more than 500 million due to the grounding. And on top of all this, Boeing is facing claims for compensation from the airlines. Shareholders filed a lawsuit claiming Boeing put profitability and growth ahead of airplane safety and honesty. And families are also suing the American airplane maker. And so at this week's Paris Air Show, Boeing executives were out to reassure the public and its customers that it is getting on top of the problems with the 737 MAX. Let's start with this from Natasha Butler at Le Bourget Airport in the French capital. The latest model of the Boeing 787 Dreamliner on display at the Paris Air Show. It's one of the planes that Boeing is banking on to salvage its reputation. The US plane maker is in crisis over its 737 MAX. Absent from the show, it's been grounded since March after two fatal crashes. The mood was somber as Boeing executives said their priority was for the 737 MAX to fly again. And words simply cannot express the sorrow and the sympathy that we feel for the families and the loved ones of those that were lost in these tragic accidents. These accidents have only intensified our efforts to ensure the highest level of safety and quality in everything we do. The 737 MAX was Boeing's fastest selling plane until a Lion Air crash in October, an Ethiopian Airlines accident less than six months later killed a total of 346 people. Preliminary investigations suggest that software designed to improve the plane's handling was faulty. Boeing hadn't informed pilots about the new software, leaving them clueless when it failed. The Paris Air Show would normally be an opportunity for Boeing to showcase its sales and successes. Instead, this year, it's become an exercise in damage control as Boeing executives try to reassure airlines that they fixed the 737 MAX. Boeing's troubles have created a window of opportunity for the company's arch rival, European plane maker Airbus. At the end of the day, Airbus is a production constrained company. Both sides have seen about 11,000 sales of the next generation single aisle jets. They can only produce so many in a given year, given all the difficulties in ramping up. So if the troubles continue, it's an opportunity, but uh, realistically, the problem should be solved by next year, so the window of opportunity will quickly close. International regulators will decide if and when the 737 MAX will fly again. 
Boeing had hoped that would be within weeks. But in a further blow for the plane maker, US regulators say the plane is unlikely to take off before December. Let's talk more about all of this now with aviation analyst Alex Macheris joining us from London. Hi, Alex. Um, just a terrible year for Boeing, or a terrible six or eight months, really, for the company. One of the things it was talking about doing uh, was rebranding the Boeing 737 MAX jets. Is that not just the ultimate sticking plaster? I mean, literally sticking something on the plane and, and, and trying to change the look and hoping no one notices? Exactly. Uh, hello, Kamal. Well, ultimately, as you were saying, with Boeing facing its largest crisis in over a decade, they are being forced to take measures that is less to do with the business and commercial side of the crisis and more to do with the reputation that has suffered massively, in fact, in one of the greatest ways Boeing has ever experienced. And ultimately, the 737 MAX, that phrase, is a household name across the globe for all of the wrong reasons. And the company do believe that the only way at the moment that could be necessary to restore that passenger trust is to actually stop referring it to the name that has such a negative association following those two fatal accidents and, and, and perhaps rebrand it. There is talk that they will drop the word MAX from the aircraft and industry leaders and airline CEOs across the world, some of them are very vocal in saying that they too agree that Boeing should rebrand. The CEO of Qatar Airways, the CEO of Kenya Airways, they have both said that they believe it's the only way passengers will fly and not be too concerned when this aircraft is back in the skies. Honestly, I'm struggling to see how that works, Alex. I mean, if I got on a plane called the 737 uh, greatest plane in the world, but I knew it was still a MAX, I'm still going to feel a little bit concerned about it. And I think a lot of flyers would feel concerned about it. And you make a very valid point, but I think, Kamal, that's because you yourself would know that it was a 737 MAX. For the rest of the public, it's actually very unlikely that they would know if the aircraft itself isn't called a MAX. Now, that may be astonishing. You may think, how mm. could Boeing try to hide away in this way, uh, uh, you know, and try to almost trick their passengers into thinking they're on a different jet? But it is to do with optics and ultimately the airlines are already speaking to the manufacturers saying that the passengers are telling them when we see 737 MAX on the safety card or if the pilot mentions it in his announcement, we will not fly. Mm -hmm. And ultimately they think that just by removing the phrase and not letting you know, the majority of passengers won't notice. I know that the 787, the Dreamliner, obviously didn't have anything major as, as fatal crashes, but it had its problems with the batteries uh, in its early life, and, and, and it, it got through all of that, it, it seems. It did. The 787 recovered pretty well after what was a very turbulent entry into service. Again, the Dreamliner was becoming a household name. It didn't suffer as much as the 737 MAX had, uh, has right now following those two accidents. But the Dreamliner, there were, you know, contradictory statements saying that it was nicknamed the Nightmare Liner after all mm. of those problems with the onboard batteries that, you know, one aircraft here in London was on fire at the gate at London Heathrow. Also Ethiopian Airlines who have suffered uh, this latest 737 MAX crash. So, you know, again, back then the optics were very bad, but it does go to show that aviation is incredibly resilient and also passengers quickly forget. Alex, there was an order uh, this past week from IAG, the owner of, of British Airways in Iberia, for some 737 planes. Now, they couched it as 737-8 planes or dash 9 planes. Are those MAX jets or, or not? Or are we sort of, is there a bit of smoke and mirrors going on here? Actually, this was particularly interesting because in what is a somewhat extraordinary measure, IAG, who are the parent company of British Airways, they have given Boeing the biggest vote of confidence that the company has seen since the crisis by signing a deal this week at the Paris Air Show for 200 737 MAX jet aircraft. This is very unusual given that this aircraft is in the heart of its crisis. It's good news for Boeing, but it has been met by backlash from the people that noticed that actually these are MAX jets because interestingly enough, they decided not to mention the word MAX when they notified the London Stock Exchange here that they are signing this deal. And again, that's probably because this could have sent jitters across the industry that at the heart of its crisis, you have a major airline player ordering such a large amount of aircraft that passengers are claiming they simply will not fly. So with a vote of confidence like that, Alex, is 
well, what's your feeling, bottom line? Can Boeing get its way out of this? Can it survive? Given that really, I know there are other plane manufacturers out there, but really it's only Boeing and Airbus that really uh, matter in the grand scheme of things for most airlines, most big airlines at least. For most airlines, exactly. The dominant players are, are Boeing and Airbus, and ultimately Boeing are extremely resilient. We shouldn't underestimate the damage that this has done and more so how this has kind of filtered down to the most basic level where I have people on the street telling me they won't fly the 737 MAX. It will lead probably to something like a rebrand where Boeing are forced to having to change the name to be able to hide away from the fact that this aircraft is the one that has suffered so famously. But Boeing as a company, they will get over this. They got over the 787 Dreamliner uh, and they'll get over the problems with this aircraft. But the handling of this hasn't been so great. And again, this is why the company has suffered so badly. Alex Macheris, it is always a pleasure talking to you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Of course, another issue we haven't addressed for the airline industry is pollution. You have 100,000 odd flights every day and that's a lot of carbon emissions. But the growing pressure for greener skies is resulting in change, things like more efficient engines and even electric planes. Once again, here's Natasha Butler at the air show. Stylish, sleek and fully electric, the aviation prototype is a glimpse into the future and more environmentally friendly flying. Powered by batteries, the nine-seater plane on display at the Paris Air Show would produce zero carbon emissions and be fueled by sustainable sources. The CEO of the Israeli startup behind the plane says it could fly commercially by 2022. Um, can we build an all-electric 787 to compete with today's planes? Well, absolutely not. Battery technology is not even close to that. But to fly at this speed, at this size, and to beat those designs that are out there since the 70s or 80s, well, here it is. This was built the way we believe planes in the 21st century should be built. Electric planes could be a sustainable option for short flights, but cutting CO2 emissions on medium and long haul travel is a bigger challenge. Aviation officials say that the airline industry is responsible for 2% of the world's carbon emissions. Climate activists say that it's nearer to 5%. And one of the problems is that the technology needed to reduce airlines' carbon footprint is still out of reach. Some airlines are experimenting with hybrid technology and biofuels. Nicolas Charbert's company is working on a hybrid plane with Airbus. The European plane maker aims to have an electric aircraft by 2035. We are all committed to reduce by half in 2050 our emissions. And the larger companies such as Airbus are very interested to make sure that we can take the quickest way to access technology. There are nearly 100 fuel-powered aircraft at the Paris Air Show, a potent sign of how far the industry has to go to become more ecological. But with air passenger numbers expected to double in the next two decades, there's a sense of urgency in the air. Now, last month, Italian lawmakers did something interesting. They approved a non-binding motion to pay creditors and suppliers with mini treasury bills, which in simple terms means they want to create an alternative currency to the euro. The move rattled the markets because on the face of it, such a move could lead to an Italian exit from the euro. Italy's Eurosceptic Deputy Prime Minister Matteo Salvini is keen on the idea of the parallel currency. And it comes at a crucial time, given the coalition there is locked in a battle with the EU over its budget plan. Brussels wants Rome to cut its public debt and to rein in its budget deficit, or it could be fined. Rome's struggle with its huge debt is well known. It has the largest debt in the Eurozone, $2.6 trillion, if you can imagine that. As a percentage of gross domestic product, that is the second highest after Greece, and more than double the 60% limit set by the EU's Stability and Growth Pact. Failure to bring down the debt could lead to a fine of $3.8 billion. So it doesn't look brilliant for Italy, which exited its third recession in a decade. We're going to talk about this with Nicola Nobile, who is a senior economist at Oxford Economics. He's on Skype from uh, Milan today. Nice to have you with us, Nicola. Why don't you explain, first of all, uh, this uh, sort of quasi-currency which the Italians are using now? How does it actually work in, in simple terms? Well, basically what happened is that like a couple of, uh, couple of weeks ago, the, the parliament passed with uh, unanimity, 
the fact a motion which uh, is uh, from a practical point of view doesn't uh, doesn't mean a lot uh, mm. in in Italy. They passed this motion in which uh, they were basically committing the government to accelerating the payment of the public administration commercial debt also through the issuance of uh, small government bonds. Mm. And uh, this, from an economic point of view, doesn't make uh, sense. Uh, doesn't make sense at all because uh, if uh, you want to pay the, 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 basically your your creditor, why not issuing uh, a normal, a normal bonds, mm. a normal bot, and then use the euro to pay to pay them. Okay, I'm trying so it, to see the sense or the point uh, or the theory, however you want to put it, in Italy exiting the euro. You know, we went through this, what was it, eight, nine years ago with Grexit, as it was known then, which then spawned Brexit, and now I don't even know what you would call this one, but what would be the theory behind wanting to leave the, the euro currency? Well, I will, first of all, I, will, I think I will call it arrived exit, which is a nice <laughs> word. You know, Very nice. Using it for, for Italy. Well, the, the idea is that um, they want uh, some, some politicians suggest that Italy will be better off outside the euro with a much weaker currency and with the possibility of, of printing as much money as they want. But uh, in order to finance more debt, but uh, we don't think that the problem of Italy are related uh, to, to currency or uh, the lack uh, of, uh, let's say, fiscal expansion. So in our view, this will be a huge mistake, creating probably a huge financial crisis with, uh, ne with very negative implications. Is Italy also on a bit of a collision course with the European Union? There's talks of potential uh, fines if they don't manage to bring their debt down below the, the European Union's prescribed levels. The European Commission sent, started, started the, the process to, to launch the excessive deficit procedure against Italy. And uh, this, in my view, is quite likely to happen and probably is quite likely to happen as early as, uh, as the summer. Now, what's happening from, from the Italian front is that they want uh, to make sure that uh, they comply with the, with the rules. But this looks incredibly difficult at the moment for a few reasons. One of the main reasons is that the economy is stuck in stagnation. And the other, and the other problem looking forward is that uh, the politicians in Italy, and I'm thinking more of uh, Salvini, hmm. Lega leader, they're arguing that Italy needs some sort of uh, Trump uh, fiscal stimulus. Yeah. So it wants, it wants to cut taxes, but there is no, there is no fiscal room for that, actually. Because you said earlier that you felt that this sort of new pseudo-currency bond, whatever you want to call it, wasn't the answer to Italy's fiscal problems. In your opinion, what is the answer? Well, I think at the, at the, I think at the moment Italy should, uh, should focus in steadily uh, reducing some of the expenditure. So Italy should, should say to, to, to the markets, OK, we're going we're gonna to slowly cut expenditure, we're going to put the debt on a sustainable path and uh, we're gonna, we are going to reduce the uncertainty around this. Mm. Unfortunately, I don't think, uh, given the political situation, I don't think this is going to happen. Nicola Nobile talking Italian economics with us this week. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Finally, one for the parents out there. Now, let's be honest. How many times have you been busy or tired or, frankly, just can't be bothered and you've popped the kids in front of the TV or a tablet or a smartphone? OK, we do it. Fine. It is a part of life in 2019, but the issue of screen time is troubling a lot of us. Now, there are any number of studies out there, both for and against. Uh, in April, for example, the World Health Organization recommended children under one year old shouldn't be exposed to electronic screens at all and that children between the ages of two and four should have no more than an hour of what it calls sedentary screen time each day. But equally, screen time, particularly educational apps, can be incredibly beneficial to young people 
who were growing up with digital technology being the norm rather than the exception. And then there are those trying to reverse the trend, young startups who see the benefit of technology but in a different way. This is one of them, Yoto, a device which aims to give children access to music and audiobooks without a screen or the all-hearing smart speaker. Ben Drury is with us now from London. He is the founder of Yoto, and great to have you with us, Ben. Why don't you give us the quick rundown, first of all, on how Yoto works? Only because, you know, heaven forbid, if something doesn't have a touchscreen these days, how does it work? <laughs> well, you know, we built this, uh, we built this product um, with our own kids in mind. In fact, my co-founder and I, we both happen to have kids around the same time. And we're both massive technoph technophiles. We have all the kind of gadgets in the house. But we really did, we felt a little bit uncomfortable about putting iPads in front of uh, one and two year olds. So our background was really around music and audio content. So we wanted to find a way to give kids access to audio based content, um, but in a way that they were in control. So we built this prototype. Um, we built a kind of a smart speaker for kids, except there's no microphone in there, so there's no privacy issues. Mm -hmm. And then we have these uh, we have these like smart cards that children put into the device, and it starts playing music, stories, learning, um, podcasts, and radio. Just just hold that up for me again, if you would, please, Ben. I'd like to see that. And and okay, so that's just a piece of card. Uh, has it got any example. magic on it? And, oh, okay, and is it? Yeah, there's a little chip inside this card. This is really similar to all of our contactless credit cards. There's a little chip in there. And these, are, these cards are really a key that unlock the content uh, which then streams to our, uh, to our Yoto player. Okay. Okay, let's talk about then the tech first before we talk about the business model, as it, as it were. What sort of reaction have you seen from the kids with this sort of thing? Because they are, there's no two ways about it, they are getting used to pressing a screen, to having a screen, to having that interactivity with them all the time. What sort of reaction do you get from this idea of, of popping a card in there and, and getting a story told to them? Sure, so, I mean, we're not completely anti-screens, you know, we do live in a world mm. of ubiquitous screens and, uh, you know, we don't want to keep kids completely away from that, but we see that audio-based content allows them to carry on playing and getting physical exercise while they're actually engaging with the content. So um, what we're seeing so far is really strong engagement. We're getting over eight hours a week on average listening time per device, um, which we think if that's eight hours less screen time, that's, that's, a, that's a great thing. Um, and the kind of content that people love, they're really engaged with our radio station. We have like our, our own kind of music radio station and they love the Enid Blyton content. We also have Roll Dahl content coming, and um, it's, it's stories which are very strong, but also we have um, podcasts which are proving quite popular as well. Right, so that takes us to the business model, and you've mentioned two you know, huge authors there, Enid Blyton and Roll Dahl. Is that, or how important is that to the su success of the whole venture about getting that sort of content on board? Like any kind of content platform, like a Netflix or something, um, content is king, the, mm. old, uh, the old cliche, and uh, it's really important that we have those key, key titles in all the key markets we're in. But there's also opportunity for us to create new content. And so we're investing in, in content ourselves um, using some of the interactive capabilities of our device. Mm. And um, yeah, there's, especially around the educational content, the things like phonics for learning, for learning English, phonics is very important. Mm. And it's really the sound of the letters. And parents often struggle with that. So their parents often struggle to support their child's learning of phonics. You said you weren't totally averse, obviously, to, to touch screens and the like, because, as you say, kids are growing up in that, in that era now. What's your view on screen time? You know, you get the likes of the World Health Organization saying children under one should not have any screen time and children up to five should have very little. Uh, what's your sort of view on, on how much is too much? Well, I think parents need to make their own call on, on what mm. they what they let their children experience. I know from, from my own personal uh, use, we, we try to limit our kids to two hours max a week. And, and I do see their behavior, like they literally turn into kind of zombies when they're, when they're in front of the screen. You can't get any sense out of them. And I think one of the things that the screen-based um, content does is it, it doesn't help the imagination and the creativity of the child because everything's presented for them in, in, in a very rich visual format. Whereas with audio-based content, um, they have to make the pictures themselves in their brains. And um, there's quite a lot of studies out there showing that 
audio-based content is actually better for creativity and imagination. So we're not, we're not completely anti-screen. We don't want to be one of those families that completely restricts their children because they could be socially excluded when the other kids in the playground mm. are talking about uh, Paw Patrol or something. But um, I think the WHO guidelines that just came out are pretty, pretty good. It's a pretty good start. You know, they've done a ton of research. And this generation of children really are the first. They're the guinea pigs. They're the first generation of children to grow up with these native touch screens. And so more research is needed to find out what the really, mm. real effect is. Oh, Paw Patrol, I'm unnervingly familiar with that. Ben Drury, thank you so much for your time. Do appreciate it. <laughs> thank you. And that is our show for this week. We'd love to hear from you, though, probably on a touch screen. You can tweet me or message me directly. I'm at Kamala AJE. Do use the hashtag AJCTC as well, or drop us an email. Uh, counting the cost at aljazeera.net is our address. And there's more online for you at aljazeera.com slash CTC. Our page has reports and entire episodes for you to catch up on, plus links to the latest business news. But that is it for this edition of Counting the Cost. I'm Kamal Santamaria from the whole team. Thanks for joining us. The news on Al Jazeera is next.